thank you, uh, Richard, for, for the recap. I, I want to uh, give a kudos to Eric and Melissa, you know, two students and the note taker, uh, to really uh, provide a very good summary for the last couple of days. And uh, as Richard mentioned, we have seen and heard many interesting presentations discussing the challenges and opportunities for uh, industrial, industrial decarbonization. You know, what, what I like to quick summarize is that some of them explore the, the technologies such as uh, electrification, uh, low carbon fuel or renewables, industry specific renewables, and the CCS and the energy and the material efficiencies. And uh, some of them really uh, exam the options for specific industry. You know, we heard of the big three, as, uh, as Richard mentioned, you know, the steel cement industry and the refining chemical we heard yesterday, and the resource extraction industry we heard on Monday. All of them show great potential is there. If we put them on the table, you know, this is a, the, the technology, this is a specific industry. You know, all of them show the great potential for industrial decarbonization and uh, electrification. So what we are going to today for the first panel, you know, first we are going to step back to review what are the common issues and the potential solutions. Then to discuss something we, you know, we haven't deep dive yesterday is really what is the full impact or system level impact when we're considering all the possibility and opportunities, you know, as we talk about different solutions. Then, you know, uh, as Richard man mentioned, uh, uh, you see, you know, my role at Stanford is the managing director of Bits and Watts, and we deal with electricity sector. So I'd really like to get some insights from the distinguished panelists today, you know, how much industrial electrification is feasible? Is 50%, 70%? 80% or even more. Then if we go a little bit uh, broad, you know, how much decarbonization is possible in the industrial sectors? So joining us today, we have five distinguished panelists as uh, uh, Richard introduced, Amit, Nell, Edison, John, and Andrew, welcome. And uh, the format today, each of you are going to give about 10 minutes, 10 to 12 minutes to share your perspective on this topic. What are the common uh, opportunities and the solutions uh, for industrial decarbonization? Then we will go to the moderate conversation. And uh, uh, I would encourage audience to submit your questions through the Q&A. And, &A. and uh, uh, you know, some of the panelists may respond to your question in written directly. And uh, some of them I will pick and uh, uh, go to the Q&A uh, part for today's conversation. So we, we, we'd like to make sure that we reserve enough time in the end for the Q&A, really want to engage you and uh, encourage you to submit questions. Uh, without further ado, I will uh, handle to the first panelist, Amit Sakar. And uh, Amit is a corporate scientist at uh, Total Energy and also is a visiting scholar and scientist at the Stanford Literary uh, I believe you're still here at the uh, at, uh, at 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 engineering court. Amit, go ahead. Hi, good morning, good afternoon. It, it's been an extreme pleasure uh, to work uh, in the organizing committee with Richard and Maxine and others um, in the panel uh, to set up this uh, this workshop. And I'm really delighted to participate as a panelist on the last day. Uh, so my role, I would just say, uh, so I'm a resident visiting scientist at Stanford. Um, uh, so I, I, I work here full time with, uh, with different research project that is sponsored by Total Energies. And from my company side, I'm a corporate research scientist for North America. I basically a technical lead for several of our R&D collaboration across the US and Canada. Uh, so before I deep dive to electrification and decarbonization solution for industry, with a particular focus on chemicals and industrial sector. I would just like to highlight one thing. Uh, so this is not a propaganda for total energy, but just to show when I started my career 10 years back, uh, the, the total amount of electricity in portfolio of total energy was less than 5%. And we had like less than a one gigawatt production capacity. And if you look at today, yeah, I'll use the, so if you look at today, so we are here like right now 10, 11 gigawatt production um, capacity. And our target is basically by 2030, we'll be reaching like around 100 gigawatt. So, and this is the scenario for uh, our 
peers also like other energy companies or uh, which traditionally has been called as oil and gas energy or oil and gas companies if you look at a portfolio prediction in by 2050 we are expecting more than 50 percent of renewables and electricity so basically this is a big transformation that is happening and we are moving from oil and gas companies or oil and gas portfolio to a more like an energy focused electricity focused uh, portfolio so this is in real uh, world this is happening and this is why I think it's, it's extremely important to find out from the research side, from technology development side, how can we basically deliver what the industry needs, what are the technology gaps. So if I look into the energy use and emissions in the, in the industrial sector and when I mentioned industrial sector is basically including everything like fertilizer in, in plastics in wood and pulp and everything like uh, they're definitely the refining and chemical and cement and, and steel that we consume as a whole, as a civilization. So 44% of industrial energy consumption is in the form of fuel. So they basically burn fuel, whether it's a coal or natural gas or oil or, or biofuel, bio and they develop that uh, energy that is needed to run those process. Only 21% is coming from the uh, electricity and the interesting is uh, that they consume about 35% of their uh, uh, the fuel as a feedstock for the running the process. I'll cover that one in, in detail. But uh, right now, the, 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 and that is a very difficult to uh, replace or without a disruptive technology. So if you look at the, so the major emitters, so here comes the, the major ones, like 52% of the emissions is coming from iron, steel, cement, refining, ethylene and ammonia. And ammonia is basically consumed as a fertilizer, but it's basically for food production and, and everything, right? So we daily life we consume. And, uh, and I heard uh, like Tom Haramillo from Stanford, he says like at least 50% of nitrogen atoms present in our body, at some point of their life cycle, uh, they started, uh, they, they touched the catalyst used for ammonia synthesis, the Heber wash process. So that much uh, like interlinked with the whole system is. And 52% of the emission from the industrial sector is coming from the, this, this few, few, uh, few uh, industry. And that consumes about, like that corresponds to 19% of global emission as per 2014 data. And now if we take a, a little bit a zoomed in look into this uh, sector that how the emissions are coming, you see like uh, basically the cement, steel, ammonia, and ethylene. I basically focused on these four because this, those consume like 52%. And you can see that like the energy requirement, it consumes about, uh, it, it generates about 20% of the emission. And that is basically the medium or low temperature heat and machine drives and driving machinery, things like that. So 40% of the emission is coming from the feedstock processing. And then rest of the emission, like 35% is coming from the burning of the fuel to, to generate the high temperature heat. Okay, now if you look at in, into this area, like the feedstock, the conditioning of the feedstock, so uh, like there are process like called calcination or it, it is used as an energy carrier like for steam methane reforming, where basically you are reforming the natural gas to produce the, uh, the hydrogen, or it is simply used as a carbon source. Like for example, naphtha cracker, where, which produce the polyethylene and it rejects some of the carbon. So these are the feedstock processing and that emits around 45%. So it's very difficult to decarbonize this sector without basically disruptive novel technologies. So we have to give a replacement of the carbon source. Okay, and then the high temperature heat, uh, uh, the, like more than 500 degrees Celsius, I think it's the most potentially the most attractive target for electrification. And then if you can address that, then you, you reduce the emission by 35%. And then we, we come to the low and mid temperature heat. So we can basically address that by, uh, by improving the energy efficiency and also through the electrification. So particularly the decarbonizing the chemical sector, and this is true for most of these industry that I mentioned like cement and steel, but since I'm, my background is chemical engineering, so I focused on this one. So chemical industry alone, it consumes about 28% of industrial and 10% of global energy. And most of them are fossil sourced, as I showed before, only 21% is from electricity, which could be also uh, coming from the fossil source. So it's a big consumption of the, the global energy and it's a very big uh, sector. And in that sector, they use as a carbon feedstock, like 58% of the, the consumption is goes to the carbon feedstock. 
which they need as a carbon source, and the 42% goes for the uh, generate the process energy to, to run the process. And they right now is only 22% of the electricity, about 2.8 uh, petawatt hour. Now, CCU has the potential to decouple the fossil resource and then reduce the emission up to 3.5 gigaton per year of, um, uh, per year by 2030. So the technology is there, but what that could cost, right? That's the main thing. And to do that, if you want to just decouple the fossil source and, and then the, make it carbon neutral, we are requiring like 18.1 uh, petawatt hour of low carbon electricity. And that will correspond to 55% of projected global electricity production in 2030. Only for one industry, that's basically chemical industry. So today it consumes 10% of global emission, global energy, and it emits that much. And if you want to just reduce that emission and then make it neutral, so you are basically looking for 55% of uh, projected global electricity production. So that's the kind of scale we are looking here. There are certain unique techno-economic uh, challenges to decarbonizing a uh, chemical manufacturing sector and as well as the other industry sector like cement or steel making, things like that. So the first one is the changing feedstock might require new process. Like remember that carbon source and on also like the step like calcination. So you just simply cannot replace them with electricity, right? So for example, if you want to replace the natural gas for SMR, you have to, uh, to produce the hydrogen, which is used to make ammonia. The alternative is basically you have to uh, generate hydrogen from the water electrolyzer and then make the ammonia. So you are changing the process. And this is where the disruptive novel technology research comes into place. The second one is basically the adaptation and scale up of al alternative furnace for very high temperature heat requirement, like more than 1,000 degrees Celsius. So that area is still not uh, matured enough for industrial deployment. Like particularly the burner design, the, how the fuel mixing and different kind of safety con, uh, consideration. So those are like very unique challenges for the industry. And then the third one is basically the because of the scale and the industry is highly integrated. Like for example, ethylene manufacturing, you, you, are, you are using a temperature of like 800, 900 degrees Celsius. And then that waste heat from that initial process, it basically used for driving other compressors in the, down the, the, in the downstream of the process and also to generate the stream. So if you change that thermal heating with the electrical heating, then you have to consider for additional requirement of driving those secondary processes. So it's a highly integrated process and if you change something at one place, then you have to address some more changes in some other place because decades of integration and optimization and then again, as we, as we heard yesterday from Jennifer Port from ExxonMobil, that's the huge scale and, and the long lifetime. Typically it's a 40 plus years of um, facilities. So it takes like really time and capital intensive retrofitting. So even if you have some technology which is available, if you want to install it into the bigger scale, it is quite time consuming and uh, the downturn of the, of the plant and all those things you have to consider. And it's also like relatively low profit margin and global competition for low cost production. Like the profit margin, particularly for the, the chemical sector or cement, those are very low, like just few cents maybe per kilogram. So you don't have much uh, room to basically improve unless there is a big incentive and that could be like something like pricing carbon and things like that. And also like the global commodity. So if you are taking all the steps in a particular geo, geographical region, and if your peers or competitor doesn't, uh, doesn't take that and they produce something in a cheaper price, then you are losing the market share, right? So those make it more complicated for new technology deployment. Okay, now look at the direct um, electrification of heating process in the industrial sector. So the heating, I think if you want to decarbonize the sector, the best approach is to basically go for the industrial, uh, the, the use of electricity for the high temperature heat. So the heating itself, if you can decarbonize the heat, and I think Addison will, will cover it more detail, then you are halfway there to decarbonize the sector. So the heat offers, um, the electrified heat offers many advantages, like it's a high, very high efficiency. It's a very precise heating, so you don't waste that much. It has a faster response time and it's stable, and it also offers high power density and greater depth of penetration in many cases. So if you look at today's high TRL options, 
So electric boiler, electric arc furnace, heat pumps for low or high, uh, medium and, or low temperature. And then the whole range of like microwave heating, mechanical vaporic compression, even the membrane separation. So these are the new unit operations or new kind of um, the unit processes or equipment that we can, we can depend on. For low TRL development, uh, like here comes the, the, the research part, like high temperature heat pump. So we still need some development then plasma clean and, uh, and furnaces, then plasma heating or direct electrical heating of the ore. So these are the terms we have basically discussed uh, for last two days, but these are the area we need to focus on for the research purpose and the opportunities. And then membrane separation for olefin, although membrane separation is a, is, is a quite old technology, but for, multi, uh, for olefin separation, it's not yet there. And then electrocatalytic synthesis is a new way we heard from uh, Eric Duchenne that uh, where the industry expect that by next five to seven years, we will be doing the electrocatalytic synthesis in larger scale. And then in the, in the other sector, like for example, the steel manufacturing, like electro winning and direct hydrogen reduction, and then electromagnetic heating technology. And, and I'll come to that in a second. So when you think about the electromagnetic heating, so it offers a wide range of opportunities. It's a very wide range of opportunities it's a new paradigm in high energy catalytic processes. And what it does, like it has a, like there are multiple, there could be induction heating, there could be radio frequency, there could be microwave, there could be infrared or the ultraviolet. And the, it's a new paradigm in high energy catalytic processes that is an opportunity. So you can get a very high temperature gradient in a relatively short distance in a even millimeter range. And it has a high penetration depth and also the precise heating. So those are the benefits that offers the electromagnetic oil technologies, but the research has been going on, but this is an area, I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a lot of opportunities and potentials are there for the academic research and the industrial research. And thanks a lot for Shafiq Zafar because there's a lot of discussion about uh, this one and I got a lot of insight from him for this slide. And then, okay, like now we, we talk about a little bit of in, indirect electrification and, and the way I define the indirect electrification, you can use the electricity to generate hydrogen and use that hydrogen as an energy vector or, or some sort of like driving the process like power generation. Okay, and then if you are using the carbon neutral electricity, then how does the overall pro, uh, efficiency looks like in term, compared to the thermal process? Here is a chart, again, I, I, I credit this to Shafiq uh, because I, I got the insight from him. So if you, if you supply like one megawatt of electricity to an electrolyzer to produce hydrogen, you get pretty good efficiency over there. But when you are taking that hydrogen and pressurizing it to the liquid form, you are losing like almost like 42% of that efficiency of that electricity input to the electrolyzer. So there has been discussion and then, but you have to be careful about the life cycle um, efficiency loss and or the life cycle overall efficiency. So it might be better for using hydrogen as a source for different chemicals, but hydrogen using power, uh, like the power generation using hydrogen, whether it's a carrier as a ammonia or is it, is it as a liquid hydrogen? So you have to be careful about the efficiency. In some cases, it might be an option if you are running an offshore uh, FPSO then maybe this is the way you have to go for hydrogen power. But in onshore, you have to think about which offers the better efficiency. Okay, now here's a little bit of uh, what Liang said, like what are the potential and what kind of challenges we are looking for? So as I said before, the share of industrial electricity today is 21%. Okay, now if you, and the 44% is basically used for generating energy, 35% for fuel as feedstock, and 21% has electricity, right? So now if you're thinking of using the electricity, electrification of the industry, so that let's assume that we will be using electricity for 65% of that demand, like 21% for electricity plus 44% as a energy demand. And how does situation looks like? Okay, this much of electricity, like almost 27,000 terawatt hour of electricity we need, uh, and that has to be carbon neutral to decarbonize the industrial energy source. That's 65% of the total energy need. Okay, and today's use is basically only like 5,700 terawatt hour. Okay, and then these are the, the electricity production, in, uh, like in terms of the total electricity production, whether it's a, it's a green or brown or, or black, in China, in US and, and EU all together. 
So you can see the magnitude of the, of the gap we are looking at, and then you have to be really careful so about like how you plan the, the technology deployment and the use your electricity for what purpose. So here is the share of electricity use in energy mix, like the current penetration for this major three sector, like with this concrete, iron and steel, and chemical and petrochemicals roughly 20%. And with that 20%, 20% um, we are at here. So if you are increasing the penetration by a factor of two, so all of a sudden you need like almost like 11,000, 12,000 terawatt hour of electricity, which is more than the total electricity production of China and EU com combined. So this kind of, and, and this is where the, the, the major investment and, and policy and the infrastructure development, those comes to meet those need. Because if, if we are expecting the industry to develop technology which runs purely on electrification, we have to make sure that we have sufficient electricity available today to drive those process because nobody wants to invest billions of dollars and then, then basically shut down the plant because there is not enough available to run the process, right? So recently, like some countries, like I was talking with Philip Lawlin and, the, and, and this idea of this comparison came from him and, and, and thanks to Philip. And he was mentioning that, uh, that France is talking about installing new, uh, six new nuclear reactor to generate extra electricity. And one of them will be dedicated for electrification, uh, for decarbonization of the iron and steel industry. So we need this short of, uh, this short of regulatory involvement and this short of, in, in this short of investment to, to meet the future demand, which you could think. So this is my last chart. So after attending all these three days, like two days and then discussion and listening to, to different experts. So I see like in looking forward, like decarbonizing the industrial sector. So it cannot be a, like a single option. So rather I see more like as, as a menu options and you have to select the menu as, as particular situation and the needs. And we definitely, and, and there are multiple of, one of them. So the first one is the alternative feedstock. So we, if we want to use the non-fossil carbon source, like we can think of bio oil and, and then biomass or biogas or the capture CO2 to run some of the processes. And that is basically the, the delivering the carbon source that the industry need. And also like we can use the carbon free hydrogen and that will replace some of the natural gas and, uh, like a demand to the industry like and, and that can decarbonize some of the sector for, like ammonia production. The second one is the like, energy efficiency. So there are still a lot of room to improve the energy efficiency and the continuous improvement. And you can get like 10, 15% improvement in your energy use and then reduce the emission accordingly. The third one is basically the electrification of heat. So we need to switch to furnaces and boilers and heat pumps that runs on carbon neutral electricity. And also the new production process where we can use the electrification directly, like for example, electric tracker with e furnace and compressor, maybe plasma cleans. So this sort of technology are being, being developed and industry is working on them. And that is a direct electrification, but again, before deployment, they, they have to make sure that there is sufficient uh, supply of the electricity to run those process. And, the, and we have to solve the intermittency and the availability of renewable and all those issues. And the, 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 another very important one is the disruptive process. And I think here the research is that the significant contribution can be coming here. Like we can always look on and you know, the work on novel carbon, uh, low carbon technologies to replace the current process. And here are the few names only. Like for example, we can, we can work on like a high temperature heat pump development, furnace or plasma assisted reforming or electrocatalytic synthesis of olefins and alcohol. This is the area I think Matt Cannon is going to talk about this afternoon or the next session. And then microwave or plasma assisted, assisted pyrolysis and drying or plasma direct electrical heating of ore or direct hydrogen reduction or IR curing. So this sort of technologies will be using the electricity and it will basically replace the existing thermal process, but it significantly more um, time consuming and probably all the, these technologies are low to medium TRL, but we need to work on, on all these aspects. And, and then the last, but very sure option like CO2 capture and storage. And also we can use that uh, CO2 for, uh, for a circular carbon economy. And we can use that as a feed to the alternative feedstock. So last but not least, so I'm really thankful uh, for Shafiq and Philip for a lot of insights and a lot of discussion. And, uh, and uh, we are fortunate to have Shafiq in the next session. 
I'm then here at the references. I'm, and thank you very much for your attention. And I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Back to Julia. Terrific. Thank you, Amit. I think uh, you know I really love the slide number six, which is a. Uh, uh, to give the number, what is the potential for the electrification? Then I hope uh, we will have a more discussion later on regarding what is the potential for the fully decarbonization. You know, is eighty five percent, and how we do alternative for the feedstock to further lower the emissions, etc. So, okay. Without further ado, let's move on to our uh, next panelist, Edison uh, Stark, and uh, uh, Edison is a director for Energy and the Environment for Clark Street Associates. And uh, uh, you know, he has a very broad background. And uh, one of them I'd like to highlight is a former uh, program director for APAE and uh, manages the uh, energy and the water nexus program for APAE. Edison, I will hand this over to you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Excited to hop into this conversation and to pick up where I'm at left off. I think it's a great opportunity to drill into one technology area specifically in one problem, which is um, something that I spent well the last couple of years digging into is specifically the process heat question. And I wanna go ahead and re dig in a little bit further on that aspect and kind of uh, recategorize how we're thinking about the industrial challenge to kind of show that you know, there are a mix of process opportunities, there are a mix of innovation, but really you know, thinking about how we systematically go after process heat is an important piece. And I know we'll be hearing from John and um, Andrew after me about specific solutions in that space. So I hope this will be a good transition to frame up why what they're doing is so important. Let me bring up my slide. Oh, there we are. Okay, great. So I'm gonna go ahead and move that out of the way. Um, I'm not in my usual working spot. I'm actually right now at my brother's um, house in uh, Iowa. So I'm standing in a windowsill, um, very different than my usual massive screen back in my office. So the point of what I'm gonna talk about today is the fact that if we are really serious about decarbonizing industry, the first thing and the most cross-cutting opportunity uh, for us is to decarbonize heat itself. So, talk a bit about what is this opportunity today you know if you start to drill down into understanding every individual process that needs to be innovated decarbonized there's a reason people go out and say oh industry is the hard to decarbonize sector because you have thousands of processes and so to re-innovate every single one of them would be an intimate and incredible challenge and the capital return on that would be very hard for any individual investors. So if you look at the industrial sector in this super detailed Sankey diagram that was developed by other lab in San Francisco, it gives you a sense. As you quickly break out in industrial sector, you get thousands of small processes that all within themselves would be a very difficult channel to challenge to decarbonize. However, you know, when you really start to drill into what is the energy usage within industry, you start to see that actually you do have an opportunity by focusing on heat itself, because industrial heat is truly a cross-cutting challenge, but also therefore an opportunity. When you drill down into global energy demand, as we all know, industry is one third. It's what we've been talking about yesterday, today, and we'll continue to talk about. And when you break that down, however, you realize that heat itself is three quarters of that, or a full 23% of global energy demand, which suddenly you start to see just process heat for industry offers an opportunity to do broad decarbonization across the industrial sector, across all different processes. And you can start to look at it and realize that industrial process heat is generated by a few set of unit operations and is standardized across industry. Steam is steam is steam all around the world. And it's used as a common carrier for a reason. You know, and similarly at higher temperatures, air and other sorts of combustion gases. Now, when you break this down, this gives kind of a clearer picture of where these opportunities are. And as we can see, it's spread across temperature ranges. High temperature heat, in this case, category, uh, categorized slightly differently from what was just shown by Ahmed at 400 Celsius and above is 11% of global energy demand. 
um, low temperature, 150 C and below, so predominantly steam is 7%. And then mid-range, a mix of steam and oils and other sorts of carriers at 5%. And so when you scale this out and look at this as global impact numbers, the impact of decarbonizing fossil heat is 85 exajoules a year. It's a full 10 gigaton per year CO2 reduction opportunity by looking and drilling into some specific unit operations. Now, we do have to admit that there are other challenges within industry. Some industrial emissions are inherent to their process chemistry. And we all recognize the challenge in steel and cement, each being very large uh, challenges within themselves and other sorts of uh, petrochemical processes. You have process emissions from what you're trying to do, but the most ubiquitous source of industrial emissions is in the generation of heat across all scales and temperatures. And so this therein lies our opportunity. So it's a burning problem. You know, today, when you look at the generation of heat, you can break this down and look at the fact that, you know, of these, of these emissions, it's categorized predominantly where globally we are using a large fraction of coal to directly generate process heat. Natural gas, if you happen to be in a location where you have natural gas infrastructure and then fuel oil where you don't. Um, other is today about the fraction of where electricity and other sorts of uh, biomass combustion is being used. And if you look at the US itself, heat is used widely across processes. You know, there's no um, one size fits all solution here, which is important to realize. When you look at categorizing industrial processes and the, um, the scale of thermal demand, um, it, it it's, it varies widely. You know, one thing that when I really started digging this problem is one thing you realize quickly is the vast, the large majority of facilities demand for thermal is small. So if you look across the manufacturing sector, 65% of facilities have a dim, an average demand below 10 megawatts. You know, when many people think about industrial processes, we're thinking about things like, oh, people's minds will flash to the largest auto manufacturers, the biggest uh, refineries, where you're talking about large processes, thermal loads in the hundreds to thousands of megawatts, but that's a small fraction of facilities. Big opportunities, but small fraction of facilities. Rather, what this tells us is we need to be thinking and focusing on modular solutions designed at the scales of the unit operations that exist today, the furnaces, the boilers that already exist. How do we design our systems to be deployed at those same scales and to be used by distributed facilities around the world, small manufacturing um, plants in industrial parks in Omaha, you know, less about large refineries that already have access to hydrogen plant uh, pipelines or large facilities in the Gulf Coast. Also, as we highlighted before, we have a distribution of solutions that are needed across temperatures. Again, if you visit, if you dig into the data, U.S. data, and look at you know kind of the, the the associated CO2 emissions with different process heat utilization, you see that as you look across temperature, you have a few places where you know. Uh, uh, heat, you see these kind of step changes, for example, low, medium, and high, high pressure steam, bringing you up to the low 200s of Celsius, higher pressure and steam. But then up here, you run into very different discrete steps where you have process heat demands ranging from these low hundreds to high thousands of, 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 of temperatures. And you have existing low cost capital solutions that exist in these space. Boilers to service these low temperatures, process heaters and furnaces that service middle ranges and electric resistive immersion heaters that exist. Now, what we see is you have to be able to compete with you know, um, the, uh, the, 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 the incumbent technology, which is an inherent challenge here. Natural gas, coal, um, is very cheap 
to be able to procure and use compared to direct utilization of grid electricity. Now I know that um, you know uh, the following two panelists will talk about how they solve the challenge of electric resistive being very expensive when you're doing direct base load from the grid. You know there are other ways to bridge this, and I'm looking forward to their conversation around this. But the point is there's scales across temperature and size that we need to be able to bridge for all different types of processes. And this is the focus that we need to be able to have. So when I explored this with uh, my former RPE colleague and co-author on a, on a report we wrote for Juul um, at the beginning of last year, we pulled together a framework and an innovation agenda that bridges these industrial needs with kind of a roadmap for researchers. And this is what I wanna walk through right now. So to be able to provide zero carbon industrial heat, we can think about it through kind of four main buckets of innovation. The first is the fuel switching. So this is what Amit pointed to when we think about bio oils or you know, using direct biomass combustion or even thinking about next generation things like developing bio coke substitutes to be able to use for metallurgy or things like that where there's processes and innovation going on to be able to make direct coal substitutes where we can then replace the fossil fuels coming in and being burnt in boilers or furnaces or directly in processes to be able to then go into our central thermal distribution systems to drive processes. Also focusing on the direct utilization of zero carbon heat where it is applicable is a very important part of the solution. This could be impaling, you know, thinking about how we more smartly integrate future industrial development with either solar thermal or centralized storage of large scale applications of solutions like what the other panelists are working on. Also being able to look at dis district and integrated steam, whether it be sourced from geothermal or nuclear or other sorts of, or, or solar thermal systems for zero, direct zero carbon heat into industrial facilities. Also the ele direct electrification of heat is absolutely a very important opportunity, whether it be through direct resistive means, direct resistive heating of processes, utilizing microwave heating, other things. Also exactly right in the innovation of higher temperature heat pumps to be able to serve the higher temperature needs to be able to drive down or make economical the direct use of grid electricity for the, the, for the direct um, the pro, uh, processing and production of industrial process heat. Ultimately, we need to think about technologies that enable better heat management as well. To be able to think about how we integrate and cascade processes focus on district heating opportunities for waste heat to be utilized from industrial facilities at other industrial facilities or other uses and being able to better integrate, looking at the development of things like higher efficiency um, or higher, um, higher effectiveness insulations, um, advanced materials uh, to enable that and also you know, technologies to be able to make, for example, industrial cold chains more efficient, like radiative cooling work that's been going on at Stanford for the past 10 years. Um, there's a lot of exciting opportunities in all of these spaces, but there's also cross-cutting fundamental thermal systems, engineering, and science that needs to be done. Some of the cross-cutting R&D needs to be able to enable the technologies that Amit was talking about, to be able to, talk, to, be able to develop new solutions across this um, kind of envisioned opportunity for a zero carbon heat is, you know, we need technologies and low to loss transfer and storage heat at higher temperatures, storage media, things like what's being worked on at Entora, you know, but also other, other temperature ranges and the ability to be able to transfer at lower cost heat to be able to move spatially. Thermally and chemically stable materials at high temperature and novel transfer heat media are important if we're going to be thinking about replacing the direct combustion in high temperature processing. You know, we definitely also need materials engineered for thermal control, you know, to be able to include tunable conductivity, emissivity, absorptivity of all, you know, materials to be able to do direct application if we're going to utilize local radiative transfer to be able to drive localized heating. 
We need uh, thermal and flow devices for high temperature that are ab enabling novel heat transfer media. And lastly, we need to focus on engineering again, not just science and engineering science, but we really need to be able to focus on developing and scaling up lab proven technologies, but also the engineering and, and, and academic work to be able to focus on the downscaling and modularization of utility scale technologies. You know, goes back to the heart of one of the first things that I said is most solutions need to be scaled down to 10 megawatts and below to be meaning, meaningfully deployed across industry and manufacturing needs in the US and around the world. And a lot of solutions run into that challenge of how do you get into truly modular deployable systems that can be downscaled and be economically competitive and utilizable at small scales. And that's gonna be a big challenge that we're gonna to need to work on to be able to truly enable broad electrification, decarbonization of process heat. So, you know, more of detail on the, the roadmap that we've laid out, you know, um, was in the paper we recently published in Juul at the beginning of uh, last year, um, lays out some of these R&D opportunities in more detail and kind of the, the cutting edge of what's going on out there. Obviously you should, um, I know, I'm sure Arun mentioned this um, at the beginning during his plenary, but you know, really, high, you know, really insightful views that he and Ravi and Asha were be able to pull together in their piece in uh, Nature Energy last year. And then, you know, lastly, I know that I saw this as a reference in, in, in the previous uh, presentation, but Rissman, if you really want a big tome to lay out and think about all these really detailed opportunities, this is a great place to look. So thank you very much. Happy to speak with anyone about you know general thinking here, but looking forward to continuing this discussion on the panel. Okay, thank you, Edison, and um, you know wonderful deep dive into the system opportunities and challenges to decarbonize the heat. So let's move on, and uh, we uh, the next two panelists will uh, are startup companies entrepreneurs are going to share with us as uh, as uh, Edison mentioned the specific technology how they help to decarbonize or electrify the, uh, the industrial sectors. So uh, the next one, we have uh, John O'Donnell. And uh, John is a CEO from Randall Energy. And uh, John, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, it's an honor to be with you. And uh, it's wonderful to follow I mean, and uh, Addison in that um, I think you've already said three quarters of what I wanted to say. and. Uh, uh, so I'll repeat some of what you said, but um, Rondo is a two-year-old company that is a team of folks who've been working on industrial heat, renewable industrial heat, some of us together for more than 15 years. Um, the company is right now making the transition from the laboratory to uh, volume production with first installations this year. We are backed by... Um, uh, the, uh, I don't need to tell you about Breakthrough Energy Ventures. Um, and I think uh, uh, Andrew will talk about their focus as well. I think they're, they've recognized that industrial heat is a critically important sector. We're also backed by Energy Impact Partners, their deep decarbonization group that is backed by the electric power industry. Because the thing that I think Andrew and I are both going to say is that we have the tools at hand today for very large decarbonization that is profitable for the industries that are being decarbonized, which is a necessary condition for the giant private capital flows that are needed to transform our industrial base. Um, I think you've already seen many versions of this slide, um, and, but to bring it close to home, um, here in California, we burn more natural gas for industrial heat than we do for electric power generation. Um, it's just industrial heat is more than 70 million tons a year. Uh, the uh, uh, previous work from Stanford has looked at the pathways here and observed that among all of California's sectors, this is the one that has not reduced in intensity or emissions transportation, electricity, you know, the, the grid have been changing. And again, it's been because there has been, there have not been 
solutions available to make this transformation. And the policy tools, things like cap and trade, have so far really not driven investment in new things uh, because it's a hard challenge. Um, as I mentioned, some of us have been working together for 15 years on direct solar thermal solutions to this problem. They have, of course, challenges with both temperature and uh, storage technologies. And we're going to talk about that more in a minute. Um, at Glass Point, I was the first employee at Glass Point, and we wound up building pilots in California, a 3,000 megawatt pipeline, and the 300 megawatts that's running today in the Middle East, according to the IEA, is more than half of all the solar industrial heat that's running in the world today. So that says there's less than 0 0.6 gigawatts uh, running today. Um, and you know, you know that this is a giant challenge, and why hasn't it happened? Well, first of all, those solar thermal technologies without energy storage that dramatically increases their cost, they can't deliver 24 hour. There are some applications like the ones that we identified at Glass Point in mining and fuel production and some other processes that can deal with that intermittency without other energy storage. But the vast majority of industrial heat demand, of course, requires continuity. Um, those technologies were one example of being able to cover a significant portion of industrial heat demand, but huge areas left out. Um, a lot of the technologies that are looked at for electrification today uh, have problems with uh, uh, efficiency when we start looking at temperature. Um, and many of them, for example, heat pumps, replacing a six inch steam line with a 36 inch hot water line. Yeah, there are a lot of university campuses around doing those things. And Stanford has been working on some of those things as well. That infrastructure overhaul is sometimes an invisible obstacle to really making the transition, even if it's technically possible. Um, and, you know, there are there are zero carbon fuels that are available at tiny supply, you know, a few percent of world primary energy demand, and only at four or five times the fundamental production cost versus today's fuels. So there are places where very strong policies have been driving them forward, and there's tremendous demand, but it's not something that can really go to scale. And there are other technologies that have permitting problems or cost problems uh, or selective availability problems that could meet the, the, the challenges of temperature and continuity, maybe cost, um, but it's some time from now. Um, maybe the answer is all of the above. The, 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 from my perspective, and I think Andrew is going to say the same thing, there is a solution set that is emerging now because of a fundamental transformation that has happened in the world. All the stuff that I was doing in solar thermal never quite made the transition to not just being cheaper than conventional electricity, but being conventional cheaper than fuel. And the great news is that what's happened in wind and what's happened in photovoltaic solar uh, this curve is Lazard backwards, NREL forwards, Los Angeles area, utility scale, energy as a service, contracted fixed price energy without volatility or other assets, compared to the cost of burning natural gas, whether you make baby food or glass or fuels or cement in California, net of California's very low uh, fuel price with respect to the rest of the world and quite modest carbon price, half of what it is in Canada, a fraction of what it is in Europe today. And intermittent renewable electricity, which by itself is not a solution to industrial heat, but as a primary energy supply, intermittent renewable electricity is crossing over right now. And uh, the one thing that we know for certain 
is that this curve will continue. The learning curve that, that you know, the, there are some right now supply chain disruptions. We've seen PPA prices rise a little bit, but there's no question about the long-term trend on either of those curves. And if we, to, so to the extent that we can deal with renewable electricity's characteristics, principally that of intermittency, you know, we have a tool at hand where the zero carbon pathway is lower cost than business as usual. Unlike carbon capture technologies that no matter how great the capex comes, if I'm burning a hundred units of fuel and I want to sequester it, I need to burn best case 10, more typically 20 more units of fuel. So it is a permanent millstone around on production costs. This pathway, as technologies to harness this fuel source, this energy source emerge, it's a completely different trajectory. And it, you know, this forecast really misses some important things that are happening in the world right now. We're sitting in Portugal today running a cement plant or any industrial facility. That blue line is twice the price. And last year in Portugal, a year before, pardon me, electricity PPA was $13 per megawatt hour. Today in Saudi, with no carbon price at Kingdom Economics, it's more than $45 per megawatt hour for industrial heat. Last year in Saudi, $10.40 electricity PPA. We are in a fundamentally new world to the extent that this can be harnessed. And that's why we and others are, you're gonna see more, I think, uh, uh, companies going after what turns out to be about a $2 trillion market opportunity in you know, harness, harnessing this and putting it to work. Um, but it's better than that, in that this is contract electricity price. If you're willing today, when people buy natural gas, they're price takers. It's kind of challenging in Europe today, and we've seen enormous volatility over time in the US. If you're willing to be a price taker and you can participate directly in electricity markets, you can have an annual average electricity prices that are a fraction of uh, natural gas prices, depending on where you are in the world. You know, on this day a year ago, uh, if you had were able to participate in wholesale electricity markets, uh, you as a generator, you would have gotten $27 a megawatt hour daily. If you were uh, an industrial user with a direct access, you would have paid $12 more than that, and you would be well above your gas price. But if you had been able to buy that day in the cheapest four hours, you would have paid about a dollar per megawatt hour. And then, okay, lift it up to 12 a fraction, again, of what it costs for um, uh, fuel use. And this is true, again, in place after place around the world. Uh, in Texas today, if you're running petrochemical in West Texas with no carbon price in the system, uh, you know, your heat cost from natural gas given prices is around $8 a megawatt hour, seven something. You would never, even if you could participate without access, wheeling charges, you would, you know, uh, elect continuous electricity, whether it's an electric boiler or an arc furnace or whatever. What people think of as electrification, we know it's way more expensive. But if at that same location, you were using a technology that gathered all the energy it needs four hours a day, you would have been last, sorry, this is 2019 data, your annual average electricity price would have been a third the cost of burning natural gas. And, you know, there are other interesting examples. Had you been in uh, this particular spot in Nebraska or this particular spot in Montana, Colorado, California, there are places where market conditions are such that your annual average energy cost, people are paying you to take the energy. Those dynamics are gonna change, of course, they look a lot like the dynamics that we've seen in the natural gas markets. There are weird dynamics associated with flaring and the, you know, the shale revolution caused all kinds of spot things. I would argue electricity markets are much more complicated, but you know, given what is going on with renewable deployment, 
um, industrial heat participating in these markets is a giant new source of flexible load. You know, what people call indirect electrification. Um, Ken Caldera and oh, his students, uh, Ruggles wrote a very interesting paper last year on the system level impacts of, in, of this indirect electrification. And, you know, indirect electrification has to solve this particular problem. You know, the, and the, the faster we can charge, the better we are in an electricity grid where we can be a tranche of demand um, yeah. So this is, of course, the current, the common problem, and now we have to go back to those criteria of continuity, temperature, cost, efficiency. One of the things, of course, one of the tools in the toolbox are electrochemical processes, notably hydrogen, where we could move energy from noon to midnight and from July to January. But I think, Amit, you said, like, it's there's a giant demand for, for green hydrogen as chemical feedstock. Using it, burning it, you know, is a little bit like, I don't know, replacing, uh, you know, repl using cognac instead of beer. It's just it's a valuable thing. And it's inefficient in terms of electricity to heat. Any direct thermal storage system, electricity to converts to heat at 100% efficiency, your toaster, your hairdryer. And electric thermal storage systems, any of them are going to be above about 90% efficiency because the only place energy is lost is through insulation. And if you're clever about it, those losses can be very low. So now the question is, okay, what are the technologies? There are older things like the molten salt systems, which have been in use for a long time. They top out at about 570 and have many safety and cost and reliability challenges. There are several folks building various versions of rocks in a box, uh, pebble bed, uh, uh, fl even fluidized bed systems that require turbo. Both of these require turbo machinery during charging. That is, if we want to charge rapidly, they're using a heat transfer fluid for uh, charging. And so you have high power turbo machinery that's needed. There's some low temp very low temperature technologies. And then there's interesting emerging research, right? There's an Australian company that's uh, looking at liquid uh, silica phase change silicon at 1414 degrees. Andrew's going to talk about, you know, again, very interesting early stage stuff using uh, uh, other storage materials, which are conductive. There are other folks looking at direct conductive storage materials as well. There's a, uh, there's a MIT backed startup that's working in that area. Um, one of my personal favorites is in a Swedish company that's using both liquid aluminum and liquid sodium for its heat transfer, Ma you know, make no, have no little problems. The, the issue is how do we, what technologies are available that can go to very large scale? How long will it take for a technology to become proven? And there is one thermal storage technology that's been in use for 200 years, storing high temperature heat at 1500 C at blast furnaces, it is aluminosilicate brick. It's made from various kinds of dirt from some of the, the most abundant minerals on earth. These so-called blast stoves or Kalper stoves run 50 years between overhauls, being heated to 1500 and cooled on about a one hour cycle, so dozens of times per day. We found a way to take another 100 year old technology uh, electric resistance heating, the same materials that have been used since the 1930s, and exploit the physics principle on the left, radiation heat transfer for charging. And radiation heat transfer, and I think, Andrew, you may say some more about it, is extremely efficient. It rises as the fourth power of temperature. The critical matter in using brick is its wonderful heat capacity and uh, durability and strength. It's brittle and it's low heat conductivity. And our solution found us a, a way of uniformly rapidly heating brick. And, uh, and then pulling heat out of it, either uh, for boiler applications. I think Addison, you pointed out that a huge portion of industrial heat transfer, in fact, about half of it, 
is uh, driving all kinds of processes from ke making chemicals to fuels to food. Um, and uh, so heat, you know, steam heat transfer is up to about 500, maybe 600 degrees. Um, but that brick material and at 500, 600 degrees, this becomes a solution for both the electricity demand and the lower temperature steam demand across lots of industrial processes. Cogeneration from fossil fuel, everybody knows it's more than 80% efficient. Its efficiency is not 100, not because of the 3% energy loss at the generator, but because of the stack losses and the lower heating value associated with burning fuel to drive it end to end an electrically driven cogeneration the, versus the energy in both forms that are delivered, again, with any electric thermal system is going to be above 95% end to end. And again, taking intermittent, low cost, zero carbon energy to deliver all of the behind the meter power and heat is a really you know, important uh, advance. These technologies also address the higher temperature uh, uh, demands. You, over the next 30 days, we're, we are currently engaged with four international cement companies on a couple of different technology pathways, and there'll be some announcements shortly. Um, and as a result, I mean, there are sectors where the, the indirect electrification solutions that we're pursuing can't address, I think Andrew's got higher temperature capabilities as well. Um, and Addison, you mentioned this, and just for scale, this year the world will pass a thousand mega, a thousand gigawatts of solar in the world, a thousand gigawatts of wind in the world. That 85 exajoules you talked about, if you convert for capacity factor, that's 9,000 gigawatts, right? We need about a 5x increase in world renewables on top of everything else just to repower this. But if the economics are right, right, if, if doing that has economic tailwinds, you know, that's the wonderful that we have solutions that are going to become economical everywhere in the world. If we just look at California on this, I'm just about done. I know I'm going over time. Here in the great state of California, I think last year, the peak electricity demand in the system was 47 gigawatts. We have more generation capacity than that, of course. We have about 28 gigawatts of PV installed. And th this is uh, everybody who is emits 25,000 tons a year or more, every industrial heat user. And you know, that's the breakdown of who uses what total trillion BTUs. Just repowering that, uh, we're going to get some of it from absorbing what's going on in the grid. But for scale, uh, excuse me, that's 100 gigawatts of new generation that's needed. So, you know, and about half of that, there are there's land nearby the industrial facilities that can carry that generation without mo it moving through the grid. And then there are other areas where it has to move through the grid. And as California, again, as an example, looks at decarbonization pathways, the state is looking at funding carbon capture pipelines, looking at rebuilding its natural gas infrastructure to carry hydrogen. Obviously down this track, we need to stiffen the grid. We need to expand its ability uh, to carry energy. And we need to reform a number of policies. If we do that, you know, EPRI did a look forward at what role electrification is going to play. I think the great news is that electrification is going to go much faster because it's got tailwinds and emerging technologies that will make this possible. And those, by doing that, you know, the, that if we have another 100 gigawatts of generation sitting around powering industrial heat, that generation will be releasable to the grid on demand and really transform the total cost of abatement when you look economy-wide. Um, this is one of several areas that need a lot more 
investigation. There's a lot of great European work on what they call sector coupling. And, um, you know, I think so far, Caldera and Ruggles have done the best work that I've seen on some of indirect electrification. California is considering its low carbon futures in the development of the scoping plan by the Air Resources Board right now. This whole topic we're talking about is not yet modeled in decarbonization futures. Um, you know, our electricity tariffs, the glass factory in Fresno, when wholesale electricity prices in July are zero, is not allowed to buy electricity below $100 a megawatt hour, so it's burning gas. You know, there are a number of matters uh, to address, but with those matters, you know, these are, there are interesting and important research topics that you've also talked about, but there are policy- uh, John, a quick uh, time reminder. Well. All right, so, you know, I think the punchline is that there's been lots of discussion that decarbonization is going to be more costly. And I think given what the solar and wind industry have already done with these technologies coming to, to, coming to, the, to the market, the, you know, the future is the, the green premium is history. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you, John. Appreciate it. And uh, uh, we have about uh, another 25 minutes left. So, uh, I would uh, uh, quick reminder for the audience, you know, please uh, uh, send your questions through the chat and the Q&A and uh, we're going to clean up after Andrew's uh, remark. So the, our next panelist is Andrew Ponek and uh, he is a co-founder and the CEO of uh, uh, Antora Energy. And uh, you know, I want to say he's a alumni of Stanford and uh, have been given many talks through different uh, uh, energy seminars or other seminars. Welcome back, Andrew. All right, thank you. And um, the, the good news is, even though we're running a little bit behind, uh, you know, I think just about everything I was going to say now has been said. Uh, so thank you, thank you to all the other the panelists for doing such a great dive into industrial electrification and industrial heat. Uh, it makes my job really easy. Um, and uh, specifically to, to John, great to uh, to uh, you know hear a little bit about what you're doing. And, and I think we're very aligned in the way we're we're seeing the world. And so I could almost just skip my talk and just say everything John said uh, is true and, and we agree with, uh, but I, I will go through a few things and try to highlight uh, you know, some interesting things that, that we've found. Um, so yeah, I, again, Antor Energy is a you know, young, young company uh, backed by some of the same uh, investors like Breakthrough Energy Ventures uh, that, that John's company is, is also backed by. And uh, we're, we're targeting some of the same problems. So a lot of similarities there. Um, you've seen this a million times. So the only thing I'm gonna say here is, you, know, you, you see these sorts of charts and it seems like the the you know the the pies the pie slices change size all the time. The the important thing to, to note here is that uh, if you look at this pie for global, you often see this where industry is a huge portion. If you look at the same pie, pie for the United States, uh, it's a little bit smaller. So if you're ever wondering like why people are sometimes showing industry being a smaller one of those slices and one time being the biggest, really has to do with the global stuff. And I really want to focus. Um, you know, just all of our thoughts on the global problem here, you know, just to look at industrial energy use, you know, the US and EU combined is less than 20% uh, of that energy use. So any of the solutions that we're talking about, you know, they can't just work here or in Europe, they have to be applied globally. Um, so uh, John and I did not uh, collaborate on our slides beforehand, um, but I think we have a very, a very similar slide here, just looking at, at primary energy. And, and I think this is really the, the important mindset to be in. If we're going to replace fossil fuels in industry, we need a new source of primary energy. It could be nuclear, it could be biofuels. Those are really the only other two areas besides fossil fuels that, that are, are, are feasible, but uh, you know, there's a lot of headwinds that uh, would prevent them from getting to scale fast. I think it is pretty clear that solar and wind have undergone an incredible transformation in the last decade. Um, and, and certainly, you know, that's where you know, we're putting our bets on what's gonna uh, you know, be the, the primary energy of the future. And, and I wanna uh, just emphasize one more thing here about primary energy. You know, this is not the same as grid parity. You know, there, there was one crossover point, which was when is solar and wind electricity cheaper than grid electricity? We're talking about a, a much more important and more fundamental crossover point, which is when you know, solar and wind are cheaper than the coal, gas, or oil uh, that could be used to generate electricity or could be used to generate heat. Um, so that, that, that's really an important thing to focus on. And, and, and that also kind of 
brings uh, to mind why industrial heat is a harder thing to decarbonize than the electricity sector is because solar and wind have to compete against the raw fossil fuel cost, not the cost of electricity after you've burned the fossil fuels in a plant that you have to pay back over you know, 20 or 30 year lifetime. So again, another uh, chart that uh, everybody has showed in, in one, one uh, version or another, you know, wh where this energy is being used and at what temperatures. Uh, fortunately, I was kind of looking at everybody's slides through and I, I think all of these numbers are, are matching up uh, between, our, uh, between our, our presentations. Um, but but I, I think there has been a lot of focus and, and, and rightly so on these sort of big three and especially the very high temperature uh, uh, use cases for heat. Um, and, and that's something that certainly Antora is very interested in as well. We have a very high temperature thermal energy storage system that I'll talk about later. But I don't wanna uh, miss the fact that yes, more than half of this problem is at relatively low temperatures. You know, companies like Rondo, Antora and many others will be able to decarbonize these areas with clean electricity from, from solar and wind. It still takes a lot of work. There's a lot of regulatory issues. Uh, like John was just mentioning, how do you get access to that cheap variable electricity from the grid? Uh, but certainly, you know, at least we think these are, these are inevitable uh, transitions to uh, thermal energy storage and electrification of this uh, sort of low temperature heat. I love what Addison said, steam is steam is steam. Uh, you know, that, that's one of the advantages of this half of the pie, the low temperature half, most of that steam, it's very easy to make the case uh, to, to transition over uh, away from fossil fuels. Uh, you know, I think the, you know, there are a few different uh, ways to do this. And again, you know, this has been talked about a few different ways. Um, you know, I think it's important to, to put a bunch of different energy sources on the same cost uh, chart, which is not frequently done. I, we've been kind of surprised at how often it's, it's not done. Here I have dollars per and BTU because that's what uh, industry uh, in the United States uses to, to, to look at fuel costs primarily. Um, you know, a really easy conversion factor is, is there's basically a factor of three between cents per kilowatt hour and dollars per and BTU. Um, and so, you know, if you, if you take, uh, you know, any of these numbers and divide by three, you can get to cents per, per kilowatt hour approximately. Um, so looking at, at, at this with natural gas, uh, you know, that kind of high price is something that's maybe more representative of what you see uh, in Europe or Asia, where you may be reliant on LNG, or you just have had, you know, more uh, price volatility, that natural gas price uh, on the low end is something more like what you'd see in the United States, since we've had historically very low natural gas prices. Um, you know, and this is another thing that, that John mentioned, you know, CCS is strictly going to be more expensive than the fuel we're using right now. Uh, and so this is uh, assuming about a $60 per ton and $125 per ton adder for a uh, per ton of, of CO2 emissions adder on top of the natural gas prices for the high and low CCS. Uh, renewable natural gas, you know, is very expensive uh, and has a pretty limited resource base. Uh, another thing that, that John mentioned again, uh, and so, you know, probably isn't sort of the, the, the ultimate solution here. Um, and, and, you know, one thing that, that I think I've seen the biggest gap between what people in industry are talking about and what people in academia or a lot of the sort of, uh, you know, kind of think tank type uh, folks are talking about is green hydrogen. Um, you know, it's not often put again on the same scale that this dollars per kilogram hydrogen has become a, 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 a metric that people use. Um, most when we go and talk to plant operators, and I would imagine if you talk to John, he sees exactly the same thing. They either have already said there's no way that hydrogen is going to be a cost effective thing to burn for heat. It may be useful in other areas, you know, as a, as a chemical input, uh, but it's not useful to burn for heat. Either they already have that opinion, or as soon as you do this conversion right there in front of them, they say, oh, okay, I see, you know, even if hydrogen's at $2 or even $1, it's not competitive uh, to, to burn for heat in, in my plant. Um, and then it's, it's again, the same, same story. Electricity, uh, variable electricity, this is important, variable electricity is now very cheap. And that can come either uh, directly from building a solar wind plant, you know, near your industrial site, or as long as you have the right regulations in place, getting it from the grid during times, for example, in California, when there's a lot of solar on the grid, or say in the Midwest, when there's a lot of wind on the grid. And, you know, it, it's really, really important, can't be emphasized enough. This only works if you're talking about the variable electricity. It's only if you're able to utilize low capacity factor electricity, do you get these low prices. If you want base load electricity to run your plant, uh, you know, to turn it into heat, then it's uncompetitive in the same way that say hydrogen is uncompetitive for heat. So uh, the, the re 
And the real key here is how do you utilize low capacity factor uh, electricity, you know, in, in um, uh, inconsistent electricity to run a consistent industrial process. Now, everything I've said here, you know, applies to, you know, uh, electrification uh, that, you know, Rondo's doing, is doing, anyone else is doing with thermal energy storage. Uh, I will just very briefly go into what Antora's system looks like. Um, so, you know, our, our, our approach to energy storage is, is a little different. We are utilizing very, very high temperature energy storage. So one of the interesting things we found when we were doing sort of a survey of the space of how we might want to store energy is that there's already a very widely scaled industrial process that stores huge amounts of energy in carbon blocks at temperatures above 2000 C. And this is graphitization furnaces. So these are electrically heated furnaces that exist in almost every country in the world uh, to make graphite. And that graphite then is used in things like electric arc furnaces. So it's one of the biggest industrial commodities in the world is, is this intermediary product in metallurgy. It's all, also carbon blocks are used in, in the aluminum industry. Um, and so our, our system is essentially a graphitization furnace uh, with the ability to extract some of that energy uh, instead of only uh, putting the energy in. And so in our system, we take solar and wind, you know, either locally or from the grid. We resistively heat the same way uh, that, that John was mentioning from, from Rondo. We, we resistively heat this graphite to very, very high temperatures. Um, and then, you know, we have a, a, a different uh, extraction method. So rather than, you know, blow air through channels in, in, the, uh, in the ceramic as, as Rondo's doing, or, you know, through a, a box of rocks. Actually, I, I loved that uh, John mentioned uh, rocks in a box, we call it box of rocks, uh, but it's the same thing. You know, there's, there's a whole uh, slew of companies that are doing uh, something similar there. Uh, you know, so rather than, than do that with a convective heat transfer, we use entirely radiative heat transfer in our system. So uh, what, what comes out of our system is, is essentially high intensity light. When you're storing energy at these very, very high temperatures, everything's glowing. Everything's glowing white hot. If you've ever seen a picture of a, a steel factory, something like that, uh, at, at those temperatures, everything is, is very, very bright. We essentially just open a shutter on the side of this box holding all this hot carbon and we get the, this beam of high intensity light coming out. One thing you can do with that light is you can uh, you know, heat your industrial uh, process. So you can use that to make steam, you could make a thermal oil, you could heat up air, you could do whatever you want uh, with that light uh, as far as heat. Um, you know, this, this, uh, we can go up to 1500 C or, or even higher, but it actually turns out Almost every industrial process uses temperatures less than 1500 C, so there's not much benefit in going higher than that. Uh, the other thing that's kind of unique uh, to Antora, though, is that with that high intensity light, uh, we can convert that light directly back to electricity uh, using photovoltaics. So uh, photovoltaics are already really good at converting light into electricity, and Antora has developed a modified photovoltaic cell uh, that can convert that light uh, into electricity. You know, solid state, no moving parts, very simple, very reliable. Um, you know, we've currently demonstrated about 40% efficiency in the fu future, we hope to get to above 50% efficiency. Uh, but this is really a, a unique capability of the system uh, that, you know, this ability to either discharge the energy that you have in the system as heat uh, or, or as electricity, depending on the industrial need. Uh, the only other thing I'll, I'll mention here, uh, just taking a closer look at the system, is that uh, uh, our system is divided into, you can kind of see that there are, are, are certain blocks there of the system. It's a very modular system. Each unit is about one megawatt uh, of thermal output and 50 hours of storage. Um, and then you just stack up as many of them as you need. And, and this gets uh, to Addison's point from earlier, you know, there are a lot of industrial sites that are less than 10 megawatts uh, of load. And so we, we really think it's important uh, to be able to address all of those that you have a pretty small building block size that you can just you know stack up together uh, in order to get to the industrial demand at, at the facility that you're working with. Um, maybe the and the last thing I'll mention about the system is the the energy density when you're storing energy in carbon at these temperatures is uh, a little mind boggling. Uh, we're we're actually pretty close to the energy density of liquid hydrogen within the system. We're far better than 700 bar hydrogen, you know, compressed hydrogen. And, and this is something that I think, uh, one, is, is, is important in a lot of industrial sites because you, you often don't have a huge amount of space, a huge amount of land to, to store this energy. And so it's important that it be compact. Um, but also, I, I think, you know, people uh, often forget that, that, you know, hydrogen also needs to be stored. Um, you know, if you're going to take renewable electricity and, and convert it into, um, into hydrogen and then burn that hydrogen, 
you, you also need to you need to store the hydrogen. There's energy costs that other presenters have mentioned there, uh, but there's also just uh, you know storage space. Unless we're going to convert all of the natural gas pipelines and natural gas storage to hydrogen, if you're talking about these, you know, for example, smaller industrial facilities, uh, you're going to have to find a place to, to store that as well. So it's really important to be able to have this very compact energy storage. So again, uh, very quick presentation. Uh, thanks to everyone else for uh, you know uh, mentioning many many of the things that. Uh, we were going to mention it, it's fun to be able to just say everybody else is right and uh, move on to the discussion. Thank you, Andrew. Wonderful, wonderful. We have about 10 minutes or 10 or 15 minutes left, so I will do a little bit uh, kind of fast pace. So I think uh, uh, one more good question from uh, Jonathan Edwards to Amit uh, is regarding the electricity grid. I would expand this a little bit more and uh, to ask uh, uh, everyone, especially, you know, three of you, uh, the last three speakers all talk about the, how we decarbonize the heat. And uh, uh, both Andrew and John mentioned that how we can use the low capacity factor, but intermittent uh, renewables to uh, decarbonize the heat is, is, is a critical. So the question is, do we expect that this large industrial power plant, industrial plant to be solely depend on the electrical grid for electricity use, assume that the grid is decarbonized, or will this industrial plant produce their own low carbon electricity, like deploy the, the renewables next to the plant or, or close to the plant? So what's your perspective? I would uh, go through from Amit, since uh, you talked about one hour ago, and uh, I want to make sure that people don't forget you, that we go from Amit to Edison to John to uh, and yeah, sure. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a very good question. And one of the, the I think it will be also one of the defining uh, criteria for deployment in a large scale industrial deployment. If you are talking about the base load, which it is a very high capacity, like a electrical steam cracker or electrical pyrolysis or, or maybe a clean. So the industry Typically, they prefer to have their own supply to limit the disruption or any kind of intermittency. If we are looking for a smaller scale, like less than 10 megawatt, and then uh, like where you have some leg room for basically uh, to, to with, uh, like tolerate some intermittency, then probably it will be either in, in, from the grid or could be like from one of the application that John and, and uh, Andrew was talking about or similar kind of uh, technology. Thank you. Yeah, you know, I one thing I want to add on to this question here is also you know, pointing to the fact that the uh, the electric grid is evolving, and that's going to be an important aspect to think about. You know, some of the solution set that Andrew and John are working on would work absolutely really well when you have behind the meter generation assets. There are certain land use challenges that might come into place in specific locations so then you are looking towards when you don't have you know kind of land use I mean, certainly i'm sure andrew's run these numbers and so is john if you have behind the meter solar and you're trying to deliver a certain base load megawattage uh, you know you probably have to 3x the size of roughly of the the thermal load to be able to then have your kind of nameplate capacity of solar generation on the back end to be able to generate a pretty consistent PPA. So it's gonna be large acreage for large, large facilities or for facilities that are land constraint, which I think is gonna be a challenge in Europe, for example, where you have a lot of old industrial facilities that are in more urban areas and you might not have land constraints. So you are gonna to have to be working from grid electricity. And so probably one area for policy intervention here is going to be around being able to open up access for uh, for um, you know, essentially being able to do direct time of day purchases for smaller facilities, which are generally more price takers, like John was talking about for natural gas consumption. You know, there's a lot of industrial facilities like the ones we were talking about below 10 megawatts that you're not having the full sway of a direct engaged relationship with your utility currently. You're much more price takers. For example, imagine your local brewery as a, as a, as a consumer, they don't have a sophisticated power purchase agreement. And so these are things that are gonna to have to evolve to be able to deal with these things. But that's one of those things that I think is a critical area for interdisciplinary work in this space. Absolutely, I would absolutely rec uh, echo that. You know, we, I, we looked at these numbers a, a moment ago. Um, 
bringing the projects to, if, if you want to build a new wind farm in Oklahoma today, it's about a 10 year interconnection process. The current average interconnection time for new solar generation in California is seven and a half years. And um, uh, California could double the amount of PV in the state carrying industrial heat with none of it connected to the electricity grid. Our solution and other thermal energy storage solutions can obviously match up with off-grid generation. And Addison, you're dead right. So that particular cement plant right there uses about 15 megawatts of electricity. It uses 840 megawatts of heat, roughly. So, and you're dead right, to make that thing 90% of its heat come from renewable electricity, it's gonna be about a 2.4 gigawatt solar facility. It can be anywhere within 20 miles, 50 miles of that site. And when you use it, when you apply that criterion, you want the, the you know, is there a spot, a land spot within 20 miles, you get to about 40% of the industrial heat that can be decarbonized without touching the grid. But then we have enormous load centers where absolutely, you know, we're gonna have to touch the grid. A few years ago, Steve Chu was going around giving a talk saying, this country does electricity the way we did roads in 1939, right? We have a lot of challenges today with um, interstate planning. We have enormous challenges, even just between the service territories of different regulated utilities in California. Um, but, you know, we have built, the country has built hundreds of thousands of miles of natural gas pipelines under a different regulatory frame. You know, we have, when, when natural gas demand started growing in California, we built a 36 inch pipeline to Wyoming. And, you know, people point out why were all the old industries in England located on the coast? It was where it was easy to bring the coal. Um, we will see a zero carbon industry evolving both to move to where renewables are plentiful and cheap. And, um, you know, the, the grid absolutely is gonna be an important part of this. There are places where there is this fortuitous matter, and you mentioned Europe, where huge amounts of offshore wind is coming into landing sites that happen to be close to major industrial centers. So some of the solutions and the, the, the early points on the scoreboard are sooner than a lot of people think. But yeah, this is absolutely a critical topic. And the thing you said, it's, it's cross-cutting. There's a tremendous amount of policy work, regulatory development, um, because today we have electricity tariffs that go back to Thomas Edison and a concept where every megawatt comes from a spinning generator that's expensive and every megawatt hour comes from burning fuel. The technology, the world has fundamentally changed and some policy development can unlock this. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with everything you just said. I'll just say from from sort of our investigations in the space, uh, you know, well well over half of industrial sites either have the potential for nearby renewables or are already in places in the grid where there's an excess of renewables or where small investments and upgrades in the grid, uh, you know, can, can make it feasible to, to get that power from the grid. And, you know, that's not everything. And so that, certainly not to say that there isn't a challenge there for, you know, industrial sites that are in areas that don't have land and don't have a strong enough grid to support this. Um, but as, as John said, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of low hanging fruit that we can go and address right now uh, without dealing with that challenge. Right, and, you know, I would add, if we're serious about decarbonization, which I think is a society we are, let's ask, how does this compare to what the other pathways are? Are we going to, you know, many, you know, there are very, very limited locations in the state and, uh, where, we could do CO2 sequestration, for example, or, you know, you're going to build, are you going to build a network of single purpose sequestration pipelines that will be used for some period? Or will we, because electricity for sure is the least cost pathway. And it's a question of when are we going to be building these grid upgrades? Um, Terrific. Okay. Then the next follow on question is really about the storage capability. Okay, if we, if we, you know, if we love renewables, we have to love storage. Then I think both John and, uh, and uh, Andrew touched on the, the septic coupling. And uh, we, we run a, another uh, webinar uh, 
several months ago regarding the sector coupling for the natural gas electricity. Because as both of you mentioned, natural gas to heat, the gas to heat right now is kind of dominate what the heat is utilized in the industrial sectors. But the number I would like to give you is one BCF the building cubic feet is the ideal line park, which is being commonly used for many natural gas pipeline. The number we got is equivalent to about 100 gigawatt hour battery storage. I'm not using thermal storage, it's a battery storage. So how do you compare the storage capability, which already naturally on the natural gas pipeline with the technology we're developing here from both technology and the economic perspective? Well, I, I think, yeah, I, I think, ahead, you know, yeah, as we know, the we have electrochemical uh, energy storage and other things for electricity to electricity, but um, the, the the materials that are in use, whether it's rocks in a box or our approach or Andrew's approach, they are all things that are not someday $50 per kilowatt hour. They start out at around $3 per kilowatt hour for the storage media. And they are not made from, you know, things that are in limited supply and it's expensive to expand the supply chain. They are made from stuff that is made at gigascale today. And we're adding a new demand to proven things. So I think there, look, there has been, and they're also not things that wear out in seven years. They're things that last for, you know, 50 years. So the, there is, of course, how fast can these technologies roll out? And um, there is today the, this matter of the venture capital to bring these technologies to market. And then the Valley of Death project finance capital, because you know the people who buy natural gas buy it as a service. Guys making potato chips don't drill gas wells. They want to buy renewable heat as a service. And some of the really critical matters associated with rollout don't have anything to do with supply chains or technology. They have to do with understanding in the financial communities of this sector that is, is one of the great, the giant development opportunities of our time. But contracting for industrial heat with somebody who makes tomato paste is completely different than contracting for electricity with the utility grid. So they're part of the answer to your question, I think, is a is a financial one. Um, and you know, the kinds of infrastructure finance that built our grid and our gas pipelines is going to come to build this kind of energy storage infrastructure and renewable generation infrastructure over the coming years. And again, the education, the policy development to support it policies, DOEs, loan guarantee programs, and other things to support that are an important part of the cross-cutting thing to drive this transition. Yeah, I think also one thing that you know, your question raises, which I think is an important one to consider here, is the fact that we're not the only users of electricity, nor will we be the only users trying to go after time of day pricing to be able to do arbitrage play. There's going to be storage built across the grid particularly you see where financing is going right now is that the up, upstream generators to be able to firm up elect, um, you know, electricity generation. So there will be a question of where do people, people capture this value? And one of the things we are hearing from Andrew and John is you know, the solutions for thermal storage are very cheap. So the ability to go and actually take a big piece of that, um, the, the, essentially that value of time of day pricing is available for industrial heat, which is great, but we're not the only ones playing for it. There's a lot of other anticipation of increased renewable generation for vehicle charging, um, for electrification of the home. And I think it's one of those things that, you know, even just these build outs that we talk about, about the necessary electricity for industrial is just a small piece of how really far it needs to go for the electrification broadly and recognizing that a lot of this storage is gonna to have to be playing in concert with other uses and other players in the space. Yeah, I think we have also think about like the, 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 term, uh, the whether it's a midterm or long-term, like in down the road, how many years and then what scale it's available, like and what kind of capacity it can deliver and then, and, and how does that compare with other technologies already on the shelf, right? So there's the balance. And so de definitely the development pathways is a very critical in this case. 
Yeah, and I'll, I'll just jump in quickly on, on what Addison said. Um, yeah, there, there are going to be lots of other things, especially shorter duration things like lithium ion batteries that are also soaking up some of this inexpensive electricity during the day. And I think that's why it's really important for things that are cheaper, like thermal energy storage, to really focus on, on higher durations and faster charging speed, because that makes uh, something like this to be an even more flexible resource on the grid than something like a lithium ion battery. We can charge, you know, after the lithium ion's already charged and we can discharge after the lithium ion has already discharged. Uh, and so, you know, as we add more and more uh, demands to the electric grid, more and more sectors from transportation to industrial heat, you know, it's gonna be important to add that flexibility wherever we can. And thermal energy storage, I think is one of the best ways to do that. Terrific. We have about, uh, you know, the last, maybe last minute or two, I wanna do a rapid fire. We'll, we'll allow each of you to have maybe 30 seconds a uh, quick summary and uh, what do you see the most important innovation? You may say a lot, but what's the most important innovation or, or investment from both technology or maybe policy perspective you think to lower the adoption hurdles and how we can rapidly scale the later stage of technology for the industrial decarbonization? Just pick one of them. Let's uh, go from uh, reverse order. Let's start from Andrew then go to John, go to uh, Edison and uh, uh, Amit. Perfect. I, I'm going to pick a, a policy one, which is uh, really making sure that electricity markets are set up uh, to properly price intermittent uh, clean power from, from stuff like solar and wind. You know, that's going to be important, not just for thermal energy storage for industrial heat, but for so many other usage usages that can, they can take advantage of, of that new resource on the grid. Policy. Okay, John. So I'd argue research and education. So I look at Macmillan's paper from uh, NREL looking at opportunities for solar thermal use in, in industry. I'd point to Hassan Beggy's paper looking at direct electrification and other in, of industrial heat and other NREL work in this in the area. Uh, you know, Caldera and Ruggles looking at in, uh, the role of intermittent elect, indirect electrification. This is enormous need. It's an enormous need for really deep dive on the what Andrew's technology, what our technology, with this whole class of indirect electrification. Where can they serve industry and educating both, working with both industry and the finance communities and government, there is an enormous need in that area because what we're talking about, almost nobody knows today. No one at JP Morgan is working on this sector right now. And the billions of dollars of private capital to flow to, uh, you know, to drive this decarbonization, that cross-cutting look at everything that we've talked about really is urgently needed. Okay, terrific, interact. Electrification. That could be a nice topic for our next panel, which is more like long-term research topic. Edison? Yeah, I think the most, you know, we've heard about technological innovations here, but I think the, the what we need to focus on moving forward to really enable this is productization, modularization, and really delivering a product that a capital projects engineer at a small facility in you know, a rural area near wind, but has never really thought about anything but their natural gas boiler or their furnace can actually comprehend. We're talking about delivering unit ops that a chemical engineer can integrate, not a novel new technology. It novel technology can't be the forefront of the sales cycle. It has to be a product that's integratable into a process. Terrific. Amit? Well, I was going to say like uh, policy and infrastructure, but since it's already mentioned by Andrew and John, <laughs> So my next target will be like, uh, basically like, what can you do, think about like developing disruptive technology, like to, to hit that 35% uh, of the energy source today that we need uh, as, a, as a feedstock. So what sort of differences in, in kind of new novel technology we can develop from a research point of view that can basically fundamentally change the, the energy requirement and also the carbon like fossil feedstock that is used today for the industry. Thank you. Terrific. Uh, I want to say thank you, Amit, Edison, and John, and Andrew for the wonderful presentation and the conversation. And uh, thank you again. I will hand this back to uh, Richard.